Hey, Canapreneurs. This week's show is sponsored by Dairy Berry's Recording Studio, located in Arvada, Colorado, with affordable rates. Mark is well experienced and will make your show, music, or any audio you have sound great. Take a look at DairyBerry'sRecordingStudio.com. Open up, Colorado. It's 420. Time to grind and burn. This is not your son, Stoner Show. Welcome to the Cannabis Community Project. This is Brainstorm, bringing you your weekly broadcast podcast from the CCP studios high up in Denver, Colorado. Here exploring the business side of this newly emerging Colorado economy, focusing on the business, the patient, the retailer, even to you geeks in the garage, creating that next innovation in cannabis. This is the first media platform to celebrate Fellow canopreneurs just like you building sustainable business models while living the lifestyle. Very good. Moving right along. So here's how it works, canopreneurs. You have a business. You have an idea. You have some thoughts about business. I mean, it could really be anything. If you've been listening for the last six months with us, you've heard pretty much everything from patients to businesses to products to individuals who have certain angles and topics like the sports nut, talking about sports. We've done a number of shows talking with products and in general about their business development. So this could be you. You could be out there working in health, legal, food, music, growing, technology, something else in the cannabis industry that you have a story to tell or some thoughts to share. And this is the community that would be best set with their ears primed, ready, and open to hear your message. If that's the case, give me a call, send me an email, Look me up on Facebook, whatever social media, whatever communication channel you use or works best for you is fine with me. I'm out there on all of them. Just look it up, Cannabis Community Project, and we'll get you on the show because I want to hear from you. And more importantly, I think other people want to hear from you. The more stories that are out there, the more people can hear about how Joe Schmo and Low Blow got together and started a business, the more confidence you're going to have the more you're going to have to run with your ideas and say, you know what, maybe I'm sick of working at my lame office job, my cubicle bit, my minimum wage, this or that. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. This is my chance. Or maybe you've never wanted to be an entrepreneur, but you just have a great idea or a product you've stumbled across and working in the cannabis industry would just be so much better, funner, more interesting Everything's is better about this industry. And because we're in the boom state, it's only going to get better. So look me up. Give me a call. I'll get you on the show just like everybody we've done in the past. Speaking of the past, do you remember last week's show with the bladeless dry trim pail? Did you know you could trim dry? Did you know you could trim without blades? Did you find the concept of pulling leaves off of flower different than slicing and dicing and cone shaping buds? It was all interesting to me and new stuff. And that's the kind of stuff I like to learn about new and interesting things. So if you didn't hear it, take a couple minutes now, get the gist of what we talked about. Then go back, listen to last week's show, and share it with a friend. Share it with your mom. Share it with your cousin. It doesn't really matter who you share it with. Just share it with somebody that's going to be as as enthused as you to listen to the word. Here we go. Last week's short-term memory flashback. Look back at the bladeless dry trim with the trim pal. Talking with Scott. And you're out in Grand Junction? Close. We're here in uh, Western Slope now at Glenwood Springs. Now, the the dry trim is the specific product. Do you have multiple products at your company? Well, we just have the trim pal. We have a few sizes in the trim pal. Uh, our machine only trims dry. This machine is more of like a uh, dryer. 
right? So oh, there's the a dryer tumbler. and a basket. Yeah, the tumbler. There you go. We've been in business for only a year and a half, but uh, we've seen significant growth in that time. So in about over, you know, 800 units. You know, this machine's been a big hit because of the capacity level. Um, so the basket rotates. Inside the basket, there's, you know, thousands of slots. The product's dry within itself, on top of itself, and then when those little leaves fall into those holes, uh, there's a stationary sling underneath the basket that kind of acts as like scissors, so when it's rotating, it just, you know, slowly just pulls out those leaves rather than cutting it. There's no blades on the machine, so there's no chopping, <laughs> unlike other trimmers, and it's a slow rotating 16 RPM Dayton motor uh, rather than, you know, 100 miles per hour that you would need to pull off those you know, real fibrous, uh, non-dry, and if you were trimming wet pieces off of the materials. Well, that sounds good, and it sounds like you're having to put on a lot of miles on the road right now to kind of take these from home show to home show, uh, different events. <laughs> <laughs> About 40,000 miles in six months, so. Oh, wow. Well, you get some books on yeah. tape. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, this machine's all about quality. Right. And then when I would mention, you know, no blades, no blades, no blades, that's when they would just come right back and uh, want to hear what it's about. Hmm. That might be a good indicator that, that there might need to be a slight change in messaging, maybe in the name, maybe add like a, a bladeless trim pail or something that that highlights that in the name or up front yeah the second you say trim the first thing that comes to mind is going to be some type of blade type system uh with a cutting or mm -hmm. something um so i so i think uh it's good if you can get people that's true attention. get their I attention mean, <laughs> sometimes we say it's not a trimmer it's a puller you know Ooh, there you go. it's not a trimmer it's a puller so there's a slogan that way <laughs> So. <laughs> well, that's good because in, in the world of, of marketing and products, there's always a need to make things very exact and precise. And there you have it, the Trim Pal working hard, getting their product out there, innovating, changing the industry. You know, if you've liked any one of the shows or products or individuals we've had on the show, reach out to them. Reach out, send them a message. You don't have to just communicate with me. Let them know you heard them on the show so they get excited. They know that the show is bringing the message out to you and you get the chance to make new friends. Everybody likes new friends, especially when they're in the cannabis industry. Don't let these people slip by you. If you find a product that's cool, don't let it get away. Anyways. Let's move on. Let's get ready for Twin News this week in news. Last week, we didn't do it because I wanted to bring you in the kitchen with Brandon making the cookies from the mocha pot, the butter we had made. I wanted to make sure to get that in there, so we skipped news last week, but we're going to get to it this week. A lot of stuff happening, and I got it for you. Now, I don't mean like I did deep investigative research and was out there on the street beating the street knocking doors getting witnesses and testimonials no 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 let me clarify i was scrolling through all my social media twitter reddit facebook and a couple other sites aggregating all the the news and articles that are keyword under cannabis marijuana weed colorado and so forth bringing it, looking through them, finding the best articles, and then reading them back to you in a spontaneous manner, uh, you know, like they're coming off the tip of my tongue, and I was just commentating on them from the hip. But in reality, I'm just really reading what's already written by somebody else and, you know, making it feel like there's some real journalism reporting going on. <laughs> Either way, it's all the same stuff everybody else is doing. Whatever road you need to get to the news, right, just like Rome, whatever it takes to get the information out there in the world and efficiently into your ears and into your brain so you can do absolutely nothing with it but i guess just know about it so here it is twin news this week in news
Here we go. Let's start off on a positive note. Cannabis law reform giving us the lowdown on golfers. You know, dump the alcohol. Marijuana smoking golfers could become more common. That's right. Now that marijuana is legalized for recreational use in Colorado and Washington, we could see more smoking golfers on the golf court, golf, golf camp, golf field. Golf? Oh, man, I don't know anything about golf. I don't even know what to call it. Anyways, I would like to see a smoking golfer rather than a drunk golfer. Drug possession laws posting our friends at the Cannabis Training University are a great example of positive forces moving to the emerging cannabis industry. That's right. If you haven't heard, there is a university out there where you can be trained in cannabis. So you thought school wasn't for you? Maybe you're not going to the right school. Cannabis law reform, anger over decision to refuse patients MS drugs. That's right. MS sufferers deny drugs, which can't stop patients screaming out in pain. I don't even want to get into that one because those kind of things just make me angry. And I do know a couple people personally with MS, but anytime the system gets involved and makes things worse and makes individuals suffer in physical violent pain... It gets me violent within me. So I don't want to get too deep into that article, but look it up. Cannabis law reform. Could pot soon be legal everywhere? Hmm. An overwhelming majority of Americans believe that the legalization of marijuana is inevitable. We'll soon find out if they're right. Marijuana Policy Project. This Vox article points out some key areas where the federal government continues its war on marijuana. If you want to help change this, please ask your senators to back the House passed amendment to block the DA from interfering with state medical marijuana laws today. That's right, the DEA. For four decades, they've been blocking marijuana science. Now, I don't know why the DEA, which is a policing agency and a propaganda agency, is in charge of federal decisions involving scientific research and medical practice. Absolutely no sense to me, and it doesn't make any sense to Ethan Nadelman, executive director of the Drug Policy Alliance. Cannabis law reform also reporting about Republican billionaire Sheldon Adelson donates $2.5 million to oppose Florida medical marijuana ballot. Oh, billionaires against billionaires. Neither one of them care. It's just all about money. Because there's another billionaire working for marijuana legalization, George Soros. So what does that mean? It means both of these billionaires are just trying to protect the bottom line of their buck and where they have their bucks invested in. Colorado preparing to spend $9 million on medical cannabis research. Breakthrough posted by the Denver Post today. Hey, have you heard about this story? It's actually an old story from the beginning stages of when medical marijuana was coming through in states. But it's good to always go back and see who was there then and who's still here now fighting. Coalition for Cannabis Policy Reform brings up an unusual witness. That's right. One who for the last 32 years as a stockbroker, Irvin Rosenfield, says he smoked over 130,000 marijuana cigarettes with the federal government blessing. Very interesting. Look that up. Coalition for Cannabis Policy Reform or Philly.com. This is one that you should know about because hypocrisy is something we should all know about, especially when it's coming from our own government. Hey, if you haven't seen the Vice video of smoking weed with the president of Uruguay, check it out. It's on YouTube. Just type it in just like that, smoking weed with the president of Ur Uruguay. Very interesting because this man is by no means a hippie, and he's been through a lot. Matter of fact, what he's been through, some might call gangsta. I mean, how many of you can say you've been shot six times and lived? How many of you have led revolutions fighting to legalize cannabis, but yet having never consumed it yourself? Truly great minds in the world. Hey, New York could be the next state to legalize marijuana. A bill to legalize medical marijuana in New York State cleared what may have been its final obstacle Thursday. Senator Diane Savino, a Democrat, said at a press conference in Albany Thursday that the Compassionate Care Act, which would legalize marijuana, should be brought to a vote in the House. Hey, have you heard about these stories coming out little by little about all the money Colorado's been making and the taxes the state is rolling in? Well, we knew that was going to happen. That's why when the ballot question was written, it was written all about money. We knew money was going to be made and we knew taxes were going to be generated. The only question was, what do we do with the money 
once we have it. So when Proposition AA for the retail marijuana taxes was put through on the question ballot, it simply stated state taxes be increased by $70 million annually in the first full fiscal year and by such amounts as are raised annually, thereafter by imposing an excise tax of 15% when unprocessed retail marijuana is first sold or transferred by a retail marijuana cultivation facility to the first $40 million of tax revenues being used for public school capital construction as required by the state constitution. And by imposing an additional tax of 10% on the sale of retail marijuana and retail marijuana products, with the tax revenues being used to fund the enforcement of regulations on the retail marijuana industry and other costs related to the implementation of the use and the regulation of retail marijuana, as approved by the voters. With the rate of either or both taxes being allowed to be decreased or increased without further voter approval, so long as the rate of either tax does not exceed 15%, and with the resulting tax being allowed to be collected and spent, notwithstanding any limitations by law. Whew, that's a mouthful, but it was enough to convince the people of Colorado that, yeah, I think selling a little bit of cannabis is going to do a lot of help. And it has. And we've seen it. We're now six months deep, six months into this experiment. And it turns out it's an experiment we've done before and one that we kind of already knew what was going to happen. So in that sense, it's not even a very good experiment. But the experiment now is the one that happens with politicians. Can they be honest? Can they be held to their word? Can they be trusted to do what they were told to do? Will they use the money as the voters voted on for schools? And will they only use money for their own enforcement and propaganda and their own governmental administrative growth and activities after the schools have been funded and only with the tax that is not from that original 15%? That's what we'll see. We have another six months left before we have a full complete calendar year. And I don't know, do we have to wait? for a full fiscal year until next year, April, May, June, or whenever? Or do we just wait for a full calendar year? Either or, there's a lot of talk about where the money is going to be spent and very little talk about school. So it's raising some red flags and raising some questions. And I have a feeling like always, the schools are going to get screwed. Why? Because schools are not really funded by state governments and they're not funded by federal governments. That doesn't mean they don't get money from it. Yes, they do get money from it. But it's small in comparison to the money that comes from the local communities with the taxes imposed on those citizens around those schools. So when a state is given a bunch of money and told to spend it on something that they're not usually in charge of and not the ones who are actually out there spending the money on education, now all of a sudden are left with a question. What do we actually do? What do we do with the money? Because we don't, I mean, when we passed this, we said, sure, sure, sure. We're going to use it for school. I mean, those are one of those rhetoric type statements that people yell out. I mean, Of course, there are things everybody's going to applaud to and say, yes, yes, yes. But nobody's actually going to stop and go, well, what does that mean? Support the schools like how? So you're just going to take $40 million and equally hack it up amongst a few thousand schools? Or are you going to set up some type of performance program? Or are you going to use the money as leverage to take that power away from the local municipalities? Because now the state is going to have more money to throw at local schools to enforce statewide ideology, statewide decisions about education. This is how the federal government first got involved. Throw a few million dollars, which in relative perspective is percentages, single single digit percentages, the amount of money in budgeting, costs, expense, and everything else that goes into education. But it's enough money that makes others dependent. Now, this is an old strategy, not just by federal governments around the world, but by kings, queens, oligarchs, and all the others who are trying to become slave owners is debt. We've understood this for a long, long time. The way to slavery is through debt. When you're indebted to somebody or something, you are a slave, even if you feel like you are walking in and out of your home on your own free will. (laughs) See, a lot of times people confuse slavery with being incarcerated. We confuse slavery with being literally 
chained down in the moment, beaten and physically forced to what to do. Well, that's more along the lines of prisoners and possibly even prisoners of war. What we have to think about is who has control of divvying out the money? Who has control of the the lockbox, right? The bank account, the ATM machine. I mean, I, I could tell my wife all day long, hey, my money's your money. But if I'm the one who keeps all the ATM cards and makes her pass every decision by me before I withdraw some money, then are we really equal partners? So the federal government used their money to get involved and take control. And now the state governments have just had a gift dropped in their lap. And that's the gift, the gift of large sums of money to influence statewide decisions. So no longer are schools highly dependent on their immediate community, but now they're going to be dependent on state funds even more. And the states are going to be dependent on federal funds and everybody's dependent on everybody, which means nobody is really in control making decisions or formulating strategies, plans, and curriculums. So at the end of the year, at the end of this year, We need to stop and ask ourselves and do some real investigation into how much money was collected, where was it collected from, who had control of it, and where is that money going? And if anybody's willing to put in a friendly wager, I'll take you up on it. And I wager that the Constitution means less to our politicians and representatives than the almighty dollar. Once the money truly starts rolling in, Schools are going to be far, far down the line, long forgot about. Self-preservation, just like anything else. The government, whether it's the State Department of Revenue or the Department of Health, somebody in there is going to be looking for more control. Somebody's going to be looking for more money. And somebody's going to be interjecting their personal ideology and philosophies and actions through the governmental process that makes all of us in one form or another a slave. That's all the news you need to know this week. And that was Twin News, This Week in News, your weekly source for up-to-date cannabis. Hi, this is True Diligence, PI, proud sponsor. If you're looking for a job in the cannabis industry, you know how fierce the competition is. Think of the character you'll demonstrate by showcasing your credentials at the beginning of the hiring process. A simple yet affordable way to show employers you're the clear choice. Visit our website at truediligencepi.com. Move your resume to the top. another great show this week interviewing another wonderful Colorado based company bringing us unique and yet very useful util products. Now that's just a perfect combination when it's unique and cool but it also has some great value and utility to it. We are interviewing Anonymous Bag. (laughs) No it's not Mr. X and it's not the X-Files. Anonymous Bag is just what it sounds. It's a bag that lets you keep the contents inside of it anonymous. And we're going to learn all about Anonymous Bag because chances are if you're in this industry on any side of it you're going to have to deal with this one way or another. Whether you're going into dispensaries you're going to need a bag, a bag that zips, closes, and locks somehow, or they're not going to let you walk out. They're not going to let you just shove things in your pocket and walk out. Now we have to have an actual secure bag. If you're at home, kids, no kids, or just friends that are a little too nosy or just a little too... Well, you know, those ones that help themselves to your fridge and also help themselves to your other stuff. Well, here's a good reason to have a locking bag. 
<sighs> it just all came together, and here we are interviewing the man himself. And he's from Colorado, right here in Broomfield, so he's part of not just the cannabis industry, but the Colorado cannabis industry. But as you're going to learn, he's not exclusively part of this industry because these bags have many, many more options for what to use them for than just what you and I are thinking of. And if you're like me, you're going to want one because I'm a very mobile person and I can't be too far without my medicine close at hand. But I also have kids at home. I also have nosy friends, nosy parents, nosy neighbors, and... To be honest, if I were to run into a nosy police officer, I would like the satisfaction of knowing that he can't get into my bag because it's locked. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. I uh, have nothing against cops. Except everything. But uh, let's, let's learn about it. And remember, this could be you because you're sitting there right now saying... I thought of that, or I could have thought of that, or I did think of that. So stop thinking and start doing some action. Get on the show and tell me about your product. And you could be the next anonymous bag. Well, no, the anonymous bag's already taken, so you'll have to figure out a different product. Maybe the anonymous lighter, or the anonymous bowl, or the anonymous, you know, whatever else needs to be anonymous. Here it is. Relax. This is going to be a good one. Timing. There you go. Excellent. I, I said earlier today, timing is not a city in China. <laughs> well, you did great timing because you got here exactly <laughs> when you said you were, basically right around 5.30. So uh, you, you planned that out just just right coming out of Broomfield there. It worked out. John Patterson, Anonymous Bags. You know, the Anonymous Bags caught my name because uh, it has you're using the Anonymous symbol or logo. Yeah, we do a little bit on our website for gig. What does that mean, Anonymous <laughs> Bag? So I had to look at it. And it was it was like the universe lined up because coincidentally, just the night before, I was online looking at backpacks that were smell proof and waterproof uh, for hmm. the purpose of carrying around my you know this little case I have, which is about as big as uh, this microphone case here, where I keep all my medicine and everything. And okay, so it was very coincidental that I stumbled across uh, your site in that, and then I started looking at everything. I was like, well, there you go. There, there's somebody who's who's thinking about what I think the average person is thinking about, like me, who's sitting at home mm-hmm. with a, a six-year-old daughter going, how can I make my, my house less stinky right. and my, my medicine, my product, whatever, it be more safe, safer, mm-hmm. whatever right. is proper there. And uh, like I said, the universe lined up, and here we are talking. Outstanding, outstanding. <laughs> so thank you for driving, what was it, 45 minutes to an hour? Yeah, look. But uh, it's my pleasure, and I, uh, you know, I, it's great to meet somebody who you know is interested in the products. Um, you know, for myself, either I've uh, spent twenty years in the luggage industry and in, in with different companies doing different things, from cooler bags to gun cases to luggage. And as what? As a designer? As, as a designer, also as a uh, sourcing person. I have a lot of experience in, in global sourcing and supply chain. Oh, excellent. But uh, I have a little bit of sales experience and a little bit of development experience, too. So took those experiences and um, brought them together, you know, to, to create a product that combines actually a lot of those elements. So it's it's very... I have, very durable construction, like a piece of luggage. It's also got insulation, like a cooler, and it locks like a gun case. So, well, I figured you you had to have had some type of background in, in design because most people, I don't think, wake up in the morning going, "I think I'm going to get involved in bags or luggage today." You probably have to come from some type of roots that was already there. So you you were working for a number of years, a whole career as a designer, working through the corporate ladder, mm-hmm. and then one day I said, I have an idea? True. And, uh, you know, I've had a few ideas, but actually about two years ago, I came up with a case. It's one of these here, um, about a five inch by a 10 inch case that's about an inch tall and inside as a foam organizer. Ooh. And what you can do is um, you can put whatever you want in here. The original design was actually as a diabetic kit because mm-hmm. I travel and I needed something to hold 
everything from yeah syringes to uh, insulin to glucometers and on and on and there wasn't any one way to do that um and so i had to cut down on space but also you know see it as something that uh is private and is my business and uh if it's the sort of thing even you take into work or whatever you know i think um you know, you're entitled to your privacy and you have to protect it. <laughs> well, was there a moment? Was there a tipping point? Did something happen in your life where all of a sudden you went full focus on an anonymous bag? Or did it just gradually, organically over time develop and and you kind of just worked on an idea that you thought would be a good idea? Well, it did, did build up over time um, as far as that. I think the original ideas carried through, um, got improved a little bit, but it is intact. But you know, honestly, once I uh, understood some of the the things that were happening with the marijuana industry here in Colorado, both medical and recreational, and the regulations, realized there would be a demand. I, I thought there would be a demand for the product, you know, for that market, and um, not only uh, serving as an exit package under Colorado law, which you have to leave uh, all product has to leave in a child resistant bag from a dispensary, or excuse me, child resistant container of some sort, right. of which mine are one kind. That it, as things were going legal here, recreational was going legal. I wanted things to be done in a adult way. You know, we, and I sometimes like to say we got our way, but let's not uh, ruin it. You know, and you know, go about it responsibly. It's a very different um, today, especially with edibles and things like that, that um, really were very rare to come across. I think until the advent of recreational marijuana, but there can be deceiving or to children or pets or to people um, who are unsuspecting, you know, represent some amount of danger and, and should be locked up. And I, uh, you know, practice that myself. And then like you, I have a family and I uh, do want it to be private and uh, secret to, to, you know, the people that need to know and don't need to know. And my kids don't need to know. <laughs> and it, it, as you described, it would be just like a gun case that even if it's obvious you're hiding something, which we kind of know what's in there. It's still there for safety and the fact that you don't need to know, you know, it's my business. And even if you think you know what you know, and you may be right, you still don't need to know. <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, one of my taglines is, you know, my business is in bags, but what you put in them is yours. <laughs> and, and so absolutely. And, and there's a difference between suspicion and proof. And also um, under lock and key is uh, keeping people out. It's, uh, you know, the child resistant standards that are in place really they more reflect that you would keep a five year old or younger out, but that older people could still get in it. Yeah. And I've always felt, yeah, that's good. That's a place to start, but I want it locked down. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm worried about teenagers more than I am sometimes infants. And maybe that's because my kids are growing up. It's just one of those things that I feel most secure when I know it's under control. Well, absolutely. And the, I got hit with this just the other day for the first time. For the previous last I don't know, two, three years, I've had a dedicated care caregiver. So I, I have not been in and out of dispensaries a lot. Um, last week, I, I happened to pass by one and the person asked me if I had my bag with me. And I was completely confused by what she was talking about. And she charged me $2.50 for basically a Ziploc, uh, a, a supersized Ziploc bag mm -hmm. that was just difficult to open for an infant, is what you said, obviously mm -hmm. not for a teenager. And uh, it, it hit me by surprise, and she informed me that she could not let me walk out, even if I were just going to shove it in my pocket without being in some type of lock container. And all I could think was, would my daughter, if she came across this, A, not be able to get into it, Absolutely, she would be able to get into it. All she had to do was just be strong enough to pinch the things and then open the zipper. So then it said, well, it would require a lock, but it was a plastic zip. It was basically a plasticky type bag. It was a strong plastic, but a smell resistant one. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, well, would a lock even be functional on this type of bag? It has to be a bank bag, basically, that where the cloth or the material is strong enough. So it's not just the lock you're getting by, it's the bag itself. And uh, and then I realized, well, neither option will work for me because I carry everything in a semi-bucket-sized container about what you described, maybe, you know, a 9 by 10 inch bucket where I keep my materials. And then I, and that's when I saw the uh, the other model you had. And I was like, well, there you go. There, There's a model for everything. Yeah, this model here. Which one is this? This is uh, what we call the ITB2, and it's uh, 
designed. Uh, and it'll hold um, a lot of things. One way you can you can measure the volume is it holds about eight cans of soda. Um, and it looks kind of like a cooler bag. It, it is. It's similar in some ways to um, like shopping totes that are for refrigerated foods that are so popular, like you know Costco or anywhere. Mm-hmm. And that's definitely uh, you know. We took some inspiration there, uh, but also includes the um, features of it is scent suppressing because this lining material keeps air inside and it's a barrier. And the lining material, is it the same type of lining that's used in cooling type products, the coolers? It looks like a silverish. Yes. Okay. Um, and it's food safe as a result, which is, you know, a big concern with what we're storing. Also has a uh, layer of um, fabric in it that is scent absorbing, has a activated charcoal. Um, and so it is not airtight. You know, I would tell you, you know, for 100%, you know, no smell. You have to have something that's plastic and airtight, but very effective at keeping stuff in. If you keep it in your car or in your room, it, it, it keeps the smell inside. Yeah. And you know, I guess everyone's kind of got to, Depends upon, of course, what you're storing the contents inside themselves already. Right. But I think it's pretty effective, and I uh, would like for you to have one and, and see what you think. Oh, I would love to. I guess the, the best way I would think of it uh, is it's human smell proof, but maybe not animal smell proof. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. I yeah. mean, if a dog were sniffing around your apartment, they're going to find it. But if a human's casually walking by... That that's what we're looking at here. That's that's a good description, and the words I use for it is, is scent suppression. It reduces it. I, I'm not going to say zero because it's not it's not a hard container, right? Um, that has a rubber seal, and uh, you know maybe someday we'll have some of those. But that's what it really takes. It has to be watertight, airtight, yeah. you know, to keep smell inside. And um, even beyond that, if if you're familiar with Barry Cooper at all, the former Texas. A uh, police officer who is like a hero D8 uh, from police officer to the most drug bust in Texas in like three years turned uh, cannabis advocate. <laughs> but he, he, he would basically put out videos about how to get through searches by cops and, you know, the methods they use and everything else. And what he basically said is anything with pores can be smelled eventually by an animal. So... Even in the the densest of plastics, they're still porous at a very micro, micro, micron level where eventually those tiny little microns of smells are going to get in and through those pores. So when choosing materials of how to transport whatever you're transporting, it has to be something that's basically as close as possible to poreless or whatever the word Mm -hmm. would be for that without any type of porous type uh, material. And uh, it made sense to me, so. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, makes sense to me as well. Um, I guess, you know, what I can say is I also feel that uh, these bags, because they're um, of a simple design and they're dark, um, that they're effective at um, not drawing too much attention, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and that's kind of part of the design. It's uh, They look at camera bags. Yeah, it's just another. Cell phone it's, bag. I mean, this could be a cell bag, phone. Yeah. N- another bag, another wallet thing, another. Right. And so. Digital camera bag. It's kind of why I went with the design I went with, you know, I, as opposed to something that it, uh, screams or advertises the contents, we'll right. just say. There's no big pot leaves on the side of these. That's right. And so, you know, I think if it's just seen by the casual observer, it draws very little attention. And, um, you know, that's kind of part of the, um, you know, the anonymity factor. Right. You know, it it's just doesn't draw a lot of attention. People kind of look and move on. But, yeah, I, you know, as far as absolute, you know, dog sort of proof smell, you know, I, it, that's very hard to come by. Well, I, I like that that you focus on that. And I think you're a good salesman for that aspect. Because, I mean, like if somebody met you on the street, they would be like, oh, wh- which computer company do you work for? <laughs> you know? I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Absolutely. It just, you know, it, it means you don't look like a stoner, right? You don't look like a stoner. You don't, you don't you're not... You're not uh, wearing the dress attire or or presenting somebody who would be looked at in public and go, oh, wow, yeah, of course, this guy's, you know, this guy's doing it. So I, I like that in the sense of the bag reflects, I think, your own personality in that sense. True. And I, I think, you know, it's, um, I think that's the, probably the one of the things I thought was most fascinating about 
actually going to retail stores here. It, it, when it is, is it's just anybody. It's just a simple cross section of society. There, there isn't a type. Right. And, you know, it's now uh, becoming more mainstream, but, you know, people, you know, I think there's also a side of everybody who somewhere in their life, most people, or I'd say many people, you know, prefer a more professional appearance or, um, or, you know, are conservative or just private, you know, don't want to draw attention. You know, there are all types in this world. But definitely as you get older, you think about, you know, the reflection that has on, um, you know, your family or whatever. Bottom line being, I think that there's a lot of people kind of in my category. Right. And, uh, you know, it's... I agree. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of a... It's part of my idea is... Because this is coming mainstream and, and because it's being retailed, there hasn't before really been any consistent way people stored their stuff. Or I mean, it was just whatever container you could find, <laughs> um, you know, because, heck, it's, it's, it's illegal. It's non-standard, you know. Right. You know My just, friends laugh because every time they see me, I have a new container, a sure. new carrying case, a new basket, bucket, tray. I mean, there, there's always something that's constantly changing. This used to be my carrying case before it turned into my microphone carrying case Got it. And, and so <laughs> forth and so forth. And, and that's kind of, I think, part of the fun with the accessories like anything Agreed. else. Agreed. Um, but also part of the reality is there is no standard. Right. And, uh, you know, in my company, I've kind of divided the products into kind of two families, bigger, fa- two major families. And one are those that are really focused on being cost of effective and sold um, as an exit package solution Mm -hmm. and then those products that are accessory oriented naturally there's some naturally there's some overlap but for instance in the in the little cooler bag i showed you you know it uses some very cost effective materials to keep the cost down a lot of value for the size i also have some very small bags that are kind of an envelope style you know very sleek and cost effective yeah this would be like a good passport kind of international traveler yeah, good when, for- when i was traveling th- this is the type of thing i would store on my waistband with the- right that's the credit true. cards and the, the everything, yeah. And then, you know, up, up market from there, I've got a line of products that have a lot nicer materials, um, much more durable liners, um, insulation, um, and in some cases, these, these foam organizers. And you know, they, do, they do command a premium. They are all still child-resistant packages. And so I think it's, it is kind of how it breaks down. And I think, you know, when people buy their second or third bags, they, they kind of step up. So I see the keys hanging off mm-hmm. of them. Does that mean there's locks also that come with each of them? Absolutely. Let me show you how that works. So this is a locking zipper. And, oh, the, okay. and the way you operate this is, one, you close the zipper. There's only one zipper. Mm-hmm. So you close it. You put a key into the head and give it a 180-degree turn, and then it is locked. Yeah, you can, you can pull back on it. Okay, so you locked it closed. It's locked like closed. A, like a bank bag would be. Okay, yeah. and it's... Not opening, okay. And then to open it is actually to put a key in it and give it another 180 degree turn and open it. Okay. So it's pretty simple. Now, are these designed to just ward off uh, curious children, or are they designed to prevent actual theft or, or you know somebody tearing into these products? Well, certainly, you know, someone can cut these. Um, and so, what I would say is, you know, they're tamper evident. You know, it, it it's protects it to the level of knowing that somebody opened it while you were not aware, had to destroy it to open it. Okay. And, you know, that's kind of the level of security they provide. Right. It's kind of like a vault where uh, if they're getting in it, you're going to know. You're going to know. There's no mission sure. impossible going yeah. on here. <laughs> You'd have to get into, uh, you know, like a home safe or something like that to go to that next level of security or a bank bag that uses a keyed lock right. that's a unique key. Um, this is a... Uh, and those are very obvious and uh, somewhat heavy because of the, the material themselves. True. And you might get robbed just because somebody thinks you're carrying money. <laughs> you know, that's that's possible. And uh, I've often wondered about that with some of the, the bags that are out there. It's pretty obviously what people are walking out with. But um, And there's a different cost element for a bag bank bag. So yeah. these are, you know, priced to be cost competitive, um, you know, starting uh, anywhere from the 250 to $3 range up to the maximum, uh, the highest retail one is, is $20. So oh, they're okay. priced effectively yeah. and they're, they're value. How, how long have you been in business? Well, like you say, we started about two years ago, the original ideas, um, but certainly over the last eight to nine months, 
business has accelerated because of the advent of uh, recreational marijuana here, right. which has been a you know new industry to get into. Um, Are you working with partners on this, or what type of, of business model are you? Do you have stores, brick and mortar? Great question. Well, we um, we're a wholesaler, so we we sell um, to dispensaries and other businesses, as well as via a few distributors. Our hope to one day do an online sale website that people can buy, or have somebody sell them online for us. My biggest thing, and where I add the most value, is, is selling on a wholesale basis. You know, like say to dispensaries and, and other people who might sell online because they they can do it more cost effective. Is that a business model market. that you're bringing from your past of what you're used to from your sourcing of kind of working within companies and sure, yeah, rather than a retail side of kind of the individual end user selling one by one. Sure. Okay. Yeah, it is. So just quickly, I wanted to know what your boss's reaction was when you brought this idea originally to him, and that's yeah. why you had to go off on your own. It was, I think, supportive. Yeah. For me, like I told you, you know, it was it's a, kind of a culmination of things coming together and experiences where I finally felt like it was a you know something I was able to put together as a venture where I really brought something, right? You know, and, and used you know, pulled from all the experiences I've had, and I feel that you know, is what made it so compelling for me. Um, and obviously the market's had a good reception and uh, it's always a race in business. Uh, <laughs> we're far, far, far from any uh, figurative finish lines, but it, the, I just have enjoyed doing the business and I've enjoyed the people I've met and the experiences I've had. Is there more products to come, more developments, always, always R&D? Absolutely. I, uh, I have more product ideas than, than I got money for sure for inventory. Well, that's what but I was talking Maybe with, one of those days it will change. Well, that's what I was Hopefully talking with not. somebody last week is that there needs to be an outlet for, for all these ideas to be funneled like a shark tank where, where specific cannabis ideas can legitimately be presented to people who mm -hmm. consider them for investment and, yeah. and collaboration. You know, I, that does exist, you know, in some forms. And I guess what I will say is, is that you're telling me about the, retail versus wholesale thing, but it kind of relates to it. What I, what I do try to spend a lot of time is talking to people who are selling the product for me and people who are buying the product. And mm -hmm. I've spent time working, you know, working the counter at a dispensary and I love the customer interaction and uh, consumer interaction. And, um, you know, that's fueled a lot of other great product ideas. This whole bag kind of philosophy of what I'm, of how I think like, smoking should be handled okay so I, I i believe people should be public about it as much as one would be with alcohol or anything else you know so if somebody can say hey i think this weekend let's go grab a beer a person should just as easily be able to tell a co-worker or somebody else hey let's this friday night let's go out and have a smoke or uh whatever but at the same time, I think it should be presented in the same manner as alcohol, whereas you don't want to present yourself as a drunk or a lush or, or somebody, somebody else that is over-consuming or, or kind of Spuds acting, McKenzie. Acting crazy. Right, acting crazy or just taking, the, taking it beyond the limit of... You know, you know the the one who celebrates the drunken blackout and the doing stupid stuff while you're extremely drunk. It, that that's taking it past the line. Mm -hmm. But there should definitely be an openness that says, "Hey, this Friday night, come on down. We'll we'll go to the smoke bar and have a smoke." And and within that, what I carry here is about the same as that. So if if I can, the reason why this bag fits so nice is because my little my little kit that I carry around I call it a dorm room. Okay. Because mine is intended to kind of be like the person who doesn't really want to go covert in the sense of smoking. You know, crawl up to the roof, go down to the basement, or doing something crazy. But at the same time, you're in an area where you probably don't want to be too discovered with it. You know, a dorm room. Uh, you know, your parents' basement or uh, maybe your cubicle at work. <laughs> no, I don't know about that. But so when I smoke, I, I always use um, three mm. devices. My exhale device. Okay. My smothering device. Okay. 
and my grinder. Okay. And these two I always use because I don't like to walk into a room where people have been smoking cigarettes. And I don't really want to walk into a room where people necessarily are blowing clouds of smoke all over the place either. And like I said, I already have a daughter. So th- these two devices I use all the time to basically, you know, get rid of smell. Mm-hmm. So your bag is just like the perfect kind of conclusion to that whole that whole idea of, of my little kit here, basically being able to smoke. Not, not anonymous per se, but you take a hit and you exhale through there and, you know, 99% disappears. You, you smother out your pipe mm-hmm. and you can sit in a room and smoke for a number of hours without necessarily the people sitting out in the living room being aware or definitely in the hall or your neighbors or anybody else being aware of it. So, I mean, it's just like, What's the word? Serendipity? <laughs> you're, you know, you're, you're back here. You know, the whole concealing well, nomis, no whole thing. Yeah. I, uh, I, I like tinkering with little perfume. I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like for a lot of people, uh, it's a hobby. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it has a decorum to it. Smoking is permitted in places that do not have public access. So think about that as places that people would not come to. Normally, in other yeah, words, like your front porch, well, your front porch is not legal to smoke marijuana on um, because a postman, a paper boy, a, anybody normally is expected to come to your front door. That's in the Greeley area? Broomfield. Broomfield. Um, yet that's why your backyard is acceptable um, or inside your house. Even outdoors in your backyard, you know, it may not be illegal, but... Uh, some common sense um, is always appreciated just as much as monit- managing loud music, right? Right. Um, is it illegal? No. Do you want to be known as a real jerk to all your neighbors? You know, uh, I don't. Unless they're jerks too. And then I don't yeah, care. It always stokes the fire, um, so to speak. But there, there's not yet a here a system of clubs, right, to go and uh, bring your own stuff. Well, there's a couple. Uh, I've never been to one. No, uh, well, but I should say they're not easily. Down, I'll, take, easily you, I'll okay. take you to the one I go to. It's uh, right downtown across from Bronco Stadium. Yeah, other than those instances, a common place yeah. where it's known that you go there for that purpose. Right. And and my only point about that being is this is large, you know, primarily as a result, talking about doing it in private space, right? Yeah. And um, therefore, you, you, you don't want a lingering smell or whatever, right? You don't want it to stink. You don't want it to smell like well, a, dorm, this was a-, a dorm room. I'll give this away for free. Think of the potential if you had a digital 3D printer that could actually shape things based right. upon people's designs that they could somehow make it home and then come there, have you created into well, what they want. there needs to be a public 3D printer that I can go and rent for a half day. Or, or it's in this little shop. Just much as the same as embroidery machines can be found you know, in little mall based shops you can come in and get your uh, logos embroidered on them like i have on this shirt or you can email these in come in and maybe work with an engineer to fine tune it um there's no limit to the imagination and and certainly there's a lot of creativity in this industry so yeah uh, it's an interesting idea i mean i I, the 3d printers are are going to basically be the next future of of products personalized there. items i mean talk about the uh you know the ipad and then the iphone the 3d printer in the home for a reasonable price you know no more than a, you know, a stove or an appliance is going to be the next iphone you know type deal but uh i agree if if i could if i could get a thousand of these printed up at, at my neighborhood 3d printer for all the costs that eliminated all the high costs of doing it any other way yeah, I would I would go down right now and get a thousand of those and a thousand of these and I would you know I would call the North Company and figure out how I'd become a reseller of those and then put together a package deal. There's so many areas in this industry. I mean, we're there's so many so many possibilities of ideas. Everything from bags to pipes to all the obvious stuff to even the non-obvious stuff. And, and I think we're going to see that when the derivatives of, of hemp really come into play. 
And uh, then we'll see some people coming up with products from liquids to creams to lotions to clothes to seeds and everything else in between where, I mean, that so so many ways to go. I wish I could be involved in it all. <laughs> and in a way, I am by being able to talk to, to all these different people mm-hmm. who are being involved in it. It's definitely a big deal if, if you believe that this is going to become a nationwide phenomenon yeah. in the next five to ten years. Oh, yeah. Um, that speculation um, is the nature of anything in the future. Uh, but I think, you know, politically there's uh, – Obviously, a change in this state, and I think many other states. Um, I expect I don't expect a uniform solution, but uh, I, I do expect that this is going to continue to to uh, to evolve. Yeah. What did your family think when you told them you wanted to go into a cannabis based product? Not not based in the sense you're making out of cannabis, but selling towards a, a community that are involved in the recreational marijuana industry well you know i i'd first say i i hope i don't ever limit my, myself strictly to this market um and I, you know given the origins of it and i think there's a lot of um, other applications but you know to answer your question um because it is something i am involved in um i've been pretty positive uh you know one you know they know that i've got some experience in these sort of products and so it's uh you know, it seemed like something I'm capable of and they're behind and support me. I have had to explain it to my children and uh, so far been favorable. I think, you know, that's another thing is the, you know, the discussions I have to follow. You know, I think on the positive side and what's made it maybe easier for me than some other types of businesses is I'm really selling safety, mm-hmm. security, storage, protection. In the end of the, at the end of the day, what people literally do decide to put in these I have no control over and right. I, I'm not condoning anything. I'm not profiting directly. Um, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but to your question about my family, it's not just my immediate family. I also have to explain myself <laughs> to my parents cause they're still alive. Oh. And, um, and you still feel a little apprehension about that. Like it's maybe gone well, but negative. you know, they'd say, uh, the industry does have a stigma yeah. and it, it's going to for a long time. It's not ever, it's going to take decades for it's as mainstream as alcohol or tobacco for whatever reasons those are, which I think are the closest comparisons. Yeah. Um, and it's very generational and regional. And so I also think sometimes we have to keep in mind, you know, what's the new normal in Colorado <laughs> is not the normal in the rest of the nation. But, you know, I feel like I'm making a positive contribution. I do believe that this is good for so- for for our society because of cutting down on crime and, and you know the illegal parties that are were pre- previously engaged at it in this state and are engaged in it elsewhere that is a fact of life as well as um, putting some controls in place is good and smart and let's like I say do this in an adult way and I think it's actually a safer outcome than alcohol will ever be mm-hmm. and I, I'm committed to that so those are the things my family is you know you know is supportive of me on and um, you know I think we're you know, my heart of hearts, I feel like we're on the right side of history. Yeah, absolutely. I, at least I know I am. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a subjective thing, but, you know, it, it, we're promoting family values and, um, like I say, it's safety, security, storage. Right. Hey, there's, those are all positives. On and per- all things, as you said, relate to many different industries. So there are products and development in products that can relate to the gun industry, relate to just pharmaceutical medicine, relate to anything else that's a, a danger out there that needs to be stored. You know, when you get up in the morning and you're thinking about developing this company and designing products, I don't even think you have to have the thought of cannabis per se. Unless that product for the day you're designing is for cannabis, I, I don't think you're you're in that position necessarily where you uh, you would have to feel like, oh, am I really in the cannabis industry? Yeah, I mean, I definitely am in, and uh, you know, I was uh, an exhibitor at the High Times Cannabis Cup. Oh, nice! And I felt like it was, uh, you know, again, it, it was a, it was a great experience. Um, I definitely am in the industry, and, and I'm on the side of the industry. Uh, at least the people I, I feel I connect with of again wanting to do this as as mandated by law and in a responsible fashion and in a fashion that uh, we don't need to uh, hold our heads down, but uh, or I don't want to get put down by you know the people who say, oh well, of course we knew this was going to happen and right. and I do uh, you know 
I, I'm a kind of a private personality and I, I, uh, you know, I hope people go about this the right way and are aware of the dangers. Um, and it's like anything, it has to be managed. Any risk has to be managed. Life is full of risks. Yeah. Um, but we want everyone to be safe. I think, especially given the medical elements of marijuana and especially to a lot of people in the medical marijuana industry, this is right up there on their, their hierarchy of priorities is to keep this stuff safe and treat it as a medicine. Yeah. Uh, and what you, medicines are stored properly and right. medicines are kept safe and um, they're only given to the people who deserve the medicine. That was one of the things uh, that came up with my kids for some reason. As well, we were was- talking about this, we said, wait, well, hey, you know, just like a prescription, never take someone else's prescription, right? <laughs> It's a fundamental. Well, you're not supposed to use other people's things that are not yours or inappropriate. So. Right. Well, I always found it ironic and kind of humorous that before in the past, and maybe still now, anytime you went to somebody's house, you went to their bathroom, and their displayed were basically everything they were doing from medicines to pharmaceuticals to everything else, just in the public bathroom, uh, you know, flip open mirror. And then never seemed to really be that big of a deal. It was expected. I mean, if you wanted to see what medicine somebody was taking, you went and used the bathroom and there it was. And I, there was never, you know, I, I grew up in a house with a nurse. And I mean, there was never really the thought that medicine was harmful. You know, it was given mm. to you by a doctor. Correct. You know, yeah, it was in one of those little things with the hard caps to open, but you know, I guess you shouldn't take what's inside, but not danger in the sense of just leaving it stacked up in your medicine cabinet in the bathroom or on the kitchen table or anywhere else. I mean, working through these stigmas, I guess, is going to be a a marketing and PR challenge, just as it is a science battle that's going on right now with people trying to do everything they can to bring information to the front, mm-hmm. of the front of the industry. We also need some good marketers out there and some good PR people to help change the bigger picture here of what's going on. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting point. I think, you know, it's also kind of by the nature of the industry, I don't know if there's any one leader. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of reflects the culture. Yeah. I think everybody's an ambassador for it. It's uh, as, as in almost anything, it's how you conduct yourself and, and that passes all around. At least that's my opinion. That's the way I try to, 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 to operate. And, and as it becomes, you know, I almost have to equate it as, as like a coming out of the closet sort of experience when something's no longer illegal and is now legal. Right. Know, it's been secretive, right? It's how that's presented. And, uh, the smoky closet. I think it's, I think it's a very <laughs> true thing. I th- think it has a lot of analogies to what homosexuals must experience. Well, people used to smoke a lot of dope in closets to try to hide it. Hide and grow in closets. And, and uh, you know, maybe there's, there's a closeted some, history. Uh, it's definitely coming out of the closet. <laughs> I think that's a fair analogy. I'll compare it maybe to something else. International travel. Yeah. Which I've done a lot. When I go to another country, I'm what those people will remember as how an American behaves. Yeah. And I think it's the same, same applies. So I, I go to great lengths in both those instances to, uh, proudly represent. <laughs> and, well, and so mean, people will remember, hey, you that have was the proper uh, that, polo shirt on with a, the company. I am logo. branded. You have a walking. business card. <laughs> you had a flyer. I mean, it's a, you have basically everything you would need for any other business. Well, true. I just mean people will remember you as that impression of right. that group of people. Right. If they've never met someone from that group before, that's a normal human It's a great experience. analogy. But There's right. certainly um, a lot of different types of dispensaries. And yeah. I have to say, personally, I've had a lot of favorable experiences and talking to people and the people I, I work with at these these um, businesses and have been very impressed, you know, with those people's uh, entrepreneurial spirit. You know, I've made a lot of good friends and had some good rapports and it's been a great way of uh, kind of bridging that cultural divide or uh, age divide. Um, so generational gap, whatever you want to say, um, <laughs> more, I've had way more positives than negatives. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, I, I've definitely seen all the types and walking around the cannabis cup, you can, you can see that. I mean, it was a, it's it was a good weekend. I was you know, surprised. Phenomenal show. People... I want to say, uh, yeah, I won't do any big call-outs other than to Rick Cusick at High Times who did an absolutely phenomenal job. And I consider that show an overwhelming success. I was surprised how many people were telling me they were coming from 
so many other places just for this. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know what percentage, but it was a huge percentage of people who told me they were there just for that. They had flown in from some other place Absolutely. just for that. The week, the, the day prior to that was the, the show where uh, a business to business trade show was, ha- was taking place before that. So there was already a glutton of businesses there um, for the, the trade show the day before um, but I, I, I would probably say at least half of the people we were talking to at the booth were from Florida or California or some other place. Yep. Quite naturally, you know, other people are often coming here from other states to see how we do it. Uh, I want to show them how we do it right. Um, yeah, so I think it was just an absolute phenomenal experience and a you know, total success. And, um, did you have one of the big expensive booths or one of a smaller, re- more reasonable booth? We had a reasonable booth. Yeah, <laughs> we, uh, uh, you know, it was it was it was actually really wonderful, and um, just had a great great experience. And uh, you know, people from all walks and uh, with something in common, and um, really, you know, really enjoyed it. Well, anything else that we should talk about? That we- no, I appreciate the chance to you know talk with you openly as well as about the bags. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, where where can people find it? Now you said you're only doing bulk type sales. Yep. One of the you know we sell it a number of different places. One of the places you can find a, a good assortment of our product is a Botanic Care in Thornton. Okay, or is this called Botanic it's Care? Botanic Care, B O T A N A C A R E dot com. So they can find your products there. Yep. And if they're a dispensary or other type of retailer, they can contact you directly for bulk sales? Yep, please uh, contact me. First of all, web is www.anonymousbags.com. And uh, contact uh, email is info at anonymousbags.com. And anonymous, like if you're like me, it's... (laughs) Yeah, it's A-N-O-N-Y-M-O-U-S. It's one of those words that you look at it and it feels like they're just switching places and where it's anonymous. Where. <laughs> <laughs> and the word itself it's, is it's onomatopoeia, right? The yeah. word itself is similar to the experience of it. And, and what uh, anonymous anonymity, uh, you know, all these other similar words. I have to do more research on the Latin roots of this. <laughs> but um, you can find us easily online and hopefully come into a store near you. Excellent. Well, I think I think we covered it. Very information. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to this week's show. Make sure to come back next week. We're going to have more guests lined up speaking with dispensary owners, growers, business owners. Make sure to follow us on all of the social media, Facebook, Cush Common, Google+. You can listen to our shows live from the website or your preferred listening platform. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spreaker, even YouTube, all under the same name, CannabisCommunityProject.com. We'll see you next week.